want to say uh, the week uh, my wife and I spent in the Vatican at this conference and, and uh, ceremonies that went with it was uh, quite remarkable, very memorable. And I'm very faithfully impressed uh, by, by the Pope Francesco Primo, or Francis the First, to all of well, you. Anyway, <laughs> my students wanted me to give him a fist bump when I had the chance, but uh, I did fist bump uh, an archbishop, but I didn't quite get up to, to the level of, of the papacy itself. But it was a real good experience. My, uh, depending on our time, and, and, and I know that it's in a 30 minute time slot, so I'm very much aware of that, um, I might not get through this this entire slide thing. It, it, there are flash drives with this PowerPoint, 15 other PowerPoint files, two videos, and some documents. They will be made available at that table when our session this afternoon is concluded. What I want to talk about is the subtitle there, The Death of Biblical Minimalism. What is that? What is Biblical uh, uh, Minimalism? The assumption that the Old Testament writings are late, not early. In other words, they the Old Testament writings did not get it away in the days of David or something like that, but it would have been hundreds of years later that they were not carefully transmitted, that their historical narratives are largely fictional, and that, for example, persons like David and Solomon never even lived, legendary characters. However, archaeology, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and other items that have come to light in the 20th century uh, and in even recent decades yeah, have been telling us a different story. I want to uh, give you uh, an example, at least one important example. It's outside of my own field of expertise, which is New Testament, but I do follow Old Testament things too. And, uh, you know, if you go to Israel from time to time, it's easy to check up on both New Testament and Old Testament excavations and talk to archaeologists and see what they're doing. Visit the museum, of course, and see some of the very best, sometimes sensational finds on display. I want to talk about the House of David inscription in Tel Dan as a, as a classic example. Uh, the first time I visited Israel was in 1992, and that's when the Tel Dan uh, inscription was found, where House of David was mentioned. So uh, that's, this is sort of my own personal uh, history with visiting Israel over the last 21, going on 22 years, following uh, this, uh, the shock waves of this discovery. So we're going to look at that, Jerusalem excavations, Mayafa S. Ostrakon, and excavations, as time permits, at Sodom and Gomorrah, and maybe even a postscript of two if we have time. So what is the house, uh, house of David inscription? There's a picture of it. And a little red arrow shows you which line were those words, beats that we actually occurred. House of David. It was found uh, in an excavation at Tel Dan. Tel Dan is north of Israel. Uh, if you're at the Tel and you walk up on a little mound, you can actually look right into Lebanon to the north. And when I was there, there were hostilities, uh, terrorist camps just on the other side of the border in southern Lebanon, and so our tour guide said, go ahead and take a look, but just don't look too long, because there are snipers. So I looked up, okay, and got back down before the bullets started coming in. The first fragment was found in 1992. Now, it was one of those things, and having been in a dig recently, I know how that could happen. The, the archaeologist isn't standing there all the time watching what everybody does. He might, be, he might have two, three, four dozen volunteers working in different locations. He can't be everywhere, and he's not always on the site. People dig and work and so on. And oftentimes you find an ostracon with writing on it, or even a stone inscription uh, where, the, uh, of course, the printing is engraved in stone, so it's much more durable than just inking on an ostracon. And uh, you don't realize what you've found. And so <clears throat> simply a stone was picked up, and it's this one, the bigger one, and it was found, and uh, along with other stones, and just hauling out what seemed to be rubble. And while it was being cleaned, somebody noticed, oh, wait a minute, there's actually Paleo Hebrew on it. And so, of course, then uh, Abraham Biron became very interested, began looking at it, and lo and behold, the words House of David were found on the stone. Now, the stone dates uh, to uh, 
uh, the 9th century or perhaps to, uh, to the 8th century, but anyway, it's a time only about a uh, hundred years or so after the time King David reigned. So it's a very, very old stone, and it's not Hebrew. It's, we say Paleo-Hebrew, but it's the alphabet everybody used uh, at that time. It's actually a Syrian inscription. So in other words, there's no propaganda here that's in favor of Israel. Nothing there that would support Israel's scripture and tradition. It's a, it's a boundary marker with some bragging on the part of the Syrian king who reminds the Israelites that he has won a battle or two, and he talks about, in passing, the house of David. And so this, this stone would have been, uh, you know, originally at a location right at the boundary between Israel's northern frontier and Syria's southern frontier. Well, he found it, in, or the team found it in 1992, and what did the minimalists say, the skeptics? Well, it might have been, you know, a fake that somebody dropped off there. The find, uh, the excavation might have been salted. So sometime in the night when nobody was looking, a stone was carried in and thrown into the earth and covered up. The next day they unearthed it. Oh, wow, look what we found. Ah, uh, it's a fake. Now, I'll say as a footnote, these claims about fakes really get silly. We find, we find stones that scholars or inscriptions and artifacts that scholars labor over for years trying to decipher, and, somebody, and somehow these were written up by an unknown fake, an unknown faker, an unknown forger. Who are these people? If we can find them, we ought to put them on our faculties because they know more than all the professors do. It's just amazing who these incredible people are. Well, so goes the reasoning and logic. Peter Kreft last night at the St. Mary's uh, in his address talked about attitude, not evidence. That's what we're talking about here. The minimalists are not being driven by logic. They're not, being, they're not interested in evidence. It's an attitude. It's a perspective. I remember one time in giving a lecture in Toronto. It was actually at Wycliffe College. And I was talking about uh, how Mark's Gospel presents the parable of wicked vineyard tenants in its most original and authentic form. The context is right. The wording is right. And this is in contrast to where this parable of the wicked vineyard tenants turns, in, turns up in a work called the Gospel of Thomas, which is a second century text produced in Syria. And there are certain types in the Jesus Seminar, certain types of scholars who want us to believe that the Gospel of Thomas version is the older and more original, closer to Jesus' version of the parable than what we have in Mark followed by Matthew and Luke. And so I trotted out the evidence, piled it on, the evidence for Mark has preserved it in its earliest and most authentic form, and uh, a professor raised his hand on the faculty of the University of Toronto, not at Wycliffe. Ah, oh, he says, oh, yeah, 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 but he says, um, yeah, I think you're too preoccupied with evidence. You need to use your imagination. And this is the world we live in. You know, it's whole imagination and hypotheses that grow out of imagination shove aside evidence when evidence gets in the way. This is what's going on with minimalism. So naturally, it's a fake, some say. And of course, when you look at it, who's the genius who inscribed this? A perfect execution physically, but paleo in terms of paleography, somebody really knows the ancient Hebrew Aramaic alphabet. It's amazing, and the grammar and everything else. Who's the genius that made this? However, in 1993, right under the feet of Biron himself, they found a second piece that matches up with the first piece, and the minimalists had to say, oh, okay, okay, I guess it's genuine. But then they went ahead and said, well, it, it doesn't really prove anything. It doesn't, it doesn't, okay, maybe David really existed, but he could just be a little tribal chieftain, which is really odd. Because if you have an inscription that's found that far north, it doesn't sound like a tribal chieftain of a small village down south. Why, why would a Syrian king inscribe uh, this inscription if David was a little nobody that just ran a small village? But, in any case, the excavations have continued in Jerusalem. And you can see there the map of the red circle. In what's called the Old City of David, which is basically uh, south, a little bit south and east of uh, the Temple Mount today. There you go. And uh, what are they finding? Well, they're finding a complex of administrative buildings. And you know the old saying that there are a couple of things that are always going to be with us, death and taxes. 
Well, taxes come out of administrative buildings. And this is uh, Eilat Mazar, granddaughter of Benjamin Mazar, the well-known Israeli archaeologist. She's continuing the work of her grandfather in Jerusalem. And what she has found is a complex of administrative buildings. Half of the city of Jerusalem were administrative buildings. Well, you wouldn't, no village, no small city would be made up of a whole bunch of administrative uh, buildings if there was no kingdom. That's overkill. And so, it can, and of course, these buildings are similar in style, design, layout, and so on that we see in other uh, kingdom capitals like Babylon and Susa and elsewhere. So the conclusion is, is that these uh, complex administrative buildings are, were there to administer a kingdom that stretched way to the south, way to the north, well, basically what is described in uh, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. So this, the, the archaeology of Jerusalem itself has confirmed the the inscription are giving us a little bit of background to that Tel Dan inscription. David was a king of a kingdom whose dimensions were what we find described in the Old Testament. He's no tribal chieftain. He's much more than that. By the way, along the way, she has found a series of seals that mention the names of ministers in King Zedekiah's administration. So we have, uh, we have about uh, 300 and some years of layers uh, at, in this, you know, basically the first, what they call the first temple period of time, that is the 900s to the 600s, with some archaeological evidence supporting the biblical narrative uh, that we have in 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings. So what do the minimalists now do? Well, okay, okay, there was a David and there was a kingdom. But who then, back in the 10th century, 9th and 10th centuries, would be able to write? And write the narratives that we have, say, in 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. So that's what they said. Oh, They contended that literacy in the 10th century was not developed enough to write the stories that talk about King David. And then not long after that, few years later, and I've noticed this in the last 21 years, it's almost like God's just listening in. <laughs> and somebody finds something and says, hey, that supports, no, 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 and then God just drops, just throws in another little pebble. Oop, oop, I have to retreat again. Well, then they come up with a new rationale for skepticism, and then God tosses in another little artifact, <clears throat> upsets it. It's, it's almost like a divine comedy. God's just sitting there watching, and, you know, he's messing with us. Or messing with the minimalists. So this ostracon is found. Now, ostraca, that's the plural. Ostracon's from a Greek word, it just means pottery, earthenware. And you can see those broken pieces, and I think, yeah, you can see where you're sitting, they have writing on them. We find Greek, Latin, Aramaic, uh, Hebrew, and so on in the Middle East. Uh, ostraca is just a way of broken pots, and it's just reusing the piece, broken flat piece of pottery, and you can write on it. Receipts. IOUs, uh, identification, names, and so on, like that. I tell my students they didn't have stickies back then, so they used ostraca. <laughs> Same function. Well, anyway, this one was found. And this one has several lines of Paleo Hebrew on it. And the exciting thing is, is that it dates to the 10th century. So this ostracon, somebody must have really used a good quality of ink, because that's all it is. This is not an inscription. It's just ink on a, on a pottery or a kiln-fired piece of pottery. And someone wrote several lines on it. Here is a, a, what it looks like as a replica. And here's a facsimile so you can see the characters even better. And the language of it is very similar to the language we have in Samuel and Kings. In fact, there are some words and phrases that parallel uh, the narrative. And so this whole question about did they have the literary skills or could anyone write that way that we see in Samuel and Kings has been answered by this ostracon. Now, it was found in a town not too many miles from Jerusalem called Kayefa. Okay? So what do you think the uh, minimalists 
uh, would retort to this. I mean, this is excruciatingly embarrassing. Pieces of evidence keep coming to light to answer specific objections that they raise. So they ask, well, was Caiapha an Israelite city? Now, this is getting to be desperate. It's only some miles, a few miles from Jerusalem. It's not likely a Philistine city under the shadow of Jerusalem could exist in the days of King David. So maybe Caiapha, so they're willing to say Philistines have that writing ability, but not Israelites. That's because the Philistines didn't write first in 2 Samuel for 2 Kings. Well, the excavations at Caiapha continued, and they noticed that the walls were constructed, casemate style, which was the way Hebrews, not Philistines, built their walls. And they found the city dump. Some of you have heard me before lecture on the importance of the city dump. So now I'm going to have a whole series, maybe a whole book called, you know, The Bible and the City Dump. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sort of a trashology of some kind. <laughs> because the, the City Dump at, at Seda tells a story. The City Dump at Sepphoris, which is a city near Nazareth, tells an important story. So does this one. So they found the city done. Well, guess what? There's a dietary difference between ancient Israelites and the Philistines. The Philistines ate, among other things, pork and dog meat. So you're going to find dog bones and pig bones in the final remains in the city dump, if it's Philistine. Well, they found nothing but kosher bones at Kayapa. It's a Jewish city. It's Israelite through and through. So the architecture supports that. The, the uh, dietary practices support that too. So sorry, but Kayapa is Israelite. So what then are the implications? The Kayapha Oscar Khan contains writing as sophisticated as we find in later Hebrew and Aramaic writing. More than adequate for the composition of the kinds of stories we find in the books of Samuel and Kings. Indeed, the Oscar Khan may actually contain some echoes of scripture itself. Now, on to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I know Steve Collins, and he's working at a place called Tel El Haman. Here it is on the map, just to help you out. That's the Dead Sea. And of course, there's the Jordan River moving up. Eventually, you get all the way up here, and you're going to find the Sea of Galilee. Now, this is called the Kakar, the circle, basically. Uh, that's its shape, slightly oblong, north to south. And it's a depressed area. It means the ground goes down. Uh, Dead Sea, and to remind you, is 1,300 feet below sea level. And by the time the Jordan goes north, or it doesn't go north, it runs north to south. But if we were to trace it to the Sea of Galilee, we're at about 600 feet below sea level. So it's a drop of about 700 feet in those so many miles from north to south. And there are a series of little streams that feed into this area. And uh, 4,000 years ago, it was rather fertile. In the book of Genesis, Lot, the nephew of Abraham, chooses to live in this area because his uh, sheep and goats and so on will be well uh, fed and well watered. And so Abraham, then, uh, he lives over here. Well, we all know about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed by some kind of spectacular fire that descended from the heavens. So what has uh, Steve Collins found in a location that uh, was uh, not inhabited for uh, 700 years? So in other words, it was inhabited in 2000 BC, suddenly got wiped out, and was re-inhabited 700 years later, 13 BC. He found massive, fiery destruction at the 2000 BC level in this tell. But it was no ordinary fiery destruction. I mean, we find evidence of fiery destruction in Jerusalem, including the very place we were digging in June. Destroyed by the Romans in the year AD 70. You find ash, burnt pieces of wood, and so on that date back uh, almost 2,000 years. But he didn't find that kind of stuff. He found something far more graphic and, and I would say sinister. Melted pottery and sand, charred, unburied human remains. I've seen his uh, pictures. It, you know, there'd have to be a warning about some of these images would be, would be disturbing to some viewers if this were shown on television. Humans thrown down and cooked to a crisp and left unburied. A city suddenly destroyed. 
But the most amazing thing is that third bullet, Trinitite. Well, you know, science is, is not my area of study, but uh, the Trinity experiment, you know what that refers to? When the, when the U.S. developed the atomic bomb and exploded it in uh, New Mexico in uh, July 1945. Germany had surrendered, Japan was still in the war, and as we know, the bomb ended that war uh, very quickly when the two bombs were dropped on Japan in August. <clears throat> but what they discovered when they detonated the bomb in New Mexico in 1945 was that it didn't just melt things and turn it to glass. We, we've always been able to do that, melt certain kinds of sands and so on and create glass. This uh, reordered the, the molecules in an unusual way, and scientists called it trinitite after the bomb experiment. That's where that word comes from, trinitite. Naturally, it only occurs until Steve Collins' work in two other places that we know of, North Africa and in uh, Siberia. Both times it was comet fragments entered the Earth at maybe 100,000, 50 to 100,000 miles per hour. At that speed, it passes through the atmosphere in just a second or two. And it superheats, and, and there's a flash of about one second, that's all. It's super hot, ranging up to 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I, I made incinerators when I was in the seminary, great sermon illustrations too, by the way, cremators and uh, incinerators so on. The main chamber is 2,000 degrees, the afterburn 2,500. You get up to 3,000 degrees, you will melt your incinerator. The refocrete, which is a fireproof cement, will turn to glass and start running like wax on a candle once it gets up to 3,000 degrees. It just can't handle any more heat. That shows you the range of what we do on this planet in melting steel and, and things like that. 7,000 degrees is out of this world, literally. That's the temperature, that's like, you may as well go to the sun, that's an atomic bomb temperature, an unnatural temperature. Well, something hit Siberia flat in several square miles of forest, and, and at, the, at the burn center, the epicenter, turned the ground to Trinitite, same, same in a location in North Africa. Well, Steve uncovers this, this just uh, two years ago. His uh, permit to continue digging at that site, and of course he's in Jordan, uh, east of uh, Israel has been renewed for another five years. And so he found, he just couldn't believe what he was finding, and, but of course he's not a chemist and, he, and he's not a geologist, and so he's not real sure what he's got, so he sends samples to a couple of labs. The, the reports come back saying, this is Trinitite, where did you get it? So what he has found is now a third site on planet Earth that we know of, where Trinitite was created not by an atom bomb, not by some man-made adventure, but something that came hurtling into the atmosphere super fast, and 4,000 years ago incinerated this city. And of course, I think that's what Genesis is talking about, and so that blast would have thrown debris and smoke very, very high, which the Rift Valley would not permit any other way, because there's wind from the north to south all the time, threw it way up, and as Genesis described, it's like a pillar of smoke that could be seen from miles around. Summing up, archaeology has been no friend to the minimalists. It's that doggone stuff called evidence. <laughs> it gets in the way of many a good and creative theory. Archaeology does not always prove things, but sometimes it does. The coherence between archaeology and the biblical narratives gives us confidence that the biblical writers do what they were talking about. I've been asked before, has an archaeological find ever contradicted anything in the Bible? That's an interesting question. I, I, my answer was, I cannot think of a thing. I've asked others, and nobody can think of a thing. Archaeology has contradicted our theories about the Bible from time to time. Archaeology usually clarifies things, provides background, and new insight, but sometimes it actually does prove uh, that a certain people existed, or a certain city was there, or a certain event occurred, that kind of information. Now, I don't have any more time, but I, you know, if I had a, had a few more minutes, I'd tell you about the Gebekli Tepe uh, discovery in South uh, East Turkey. This one has knocked minimalists um, in the big scene on their ears. Uh, it has to do with anthropology, and it looks
almost like belief in God generated civilization. It used to be the naturalist argued for the other way around. Civilization that gave way to having a king, a king needing to justify himself, collecting taxes, he invented religion, because he was now port portraying himself as the go-between humanity below and the gods above. That, that was the naturalist uh, uh, interpretation. But this remarkable discovery in Turkey, I mean, this was all buried, it had to be unearthed, has led to a reconsideration. These are models of what they think. It, it's not quite like a stone hinge, but you can see the circular thing. And so this is forcing uh, naturalists to rethink, and it's leading some to think, you know what, it, I think what got human civilization going was belief in God. That's another point that's consistent with the scriptural story. Some other time, I'll tell you all about that guy and the bones that we looked at, but you'll have to wait for another time. Unless you want to get the flash drive.